Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the Master of Data Science program, Vancouver campus uh, virtual panel discussion. Uh, before we get started, uh, we acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver Point Grey campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. We recognize that you are all joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Um, thank you for joining us from all over the world. Uh, my name is Milad Meme. I'm the Director of uh, Program Operations and Student Management for the Man Vancouver uh, Master of Data Science Program. Um, this webinar is the opportunity for prospective students to ask questions from our program students and alumni uh, about their experience applying to the program, going through the program, and looking for work after graduating. Uh, so we will not be answering any questions uh, that are related to admit to the admissions and application processes. Um, we have another virtual panel discussion coming up in December um, where we'll be answering questions about admissions, curriculum, application, financial aid, and, and those kind of things. Um, you can register for that panel discussion on our website and submit your questions in advance, just like you did for uh, this, uh, this session. Um, so for the next hour, um, we will um, be answering questions that you submitted while you registered for this session. And uh, we've collected those questions and we're going to pose the most um, relevant uh, and most popular questions to our panelists. And um, if you have any questions that come up and, uh, in the, and you want to ask, ask them at, uh, from the panelists live, you can post them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom uh, page. We will try to get to most of your questions, but I apologize in advance if we don't have time for all of your questions. Um, so without further ado, I would like to turn it over to our panelists. Um, if you could introduce yourself and give uh, everyone a little bit of background uh, about yourself and which cohort uh, you're graduated from or in, uh, and we can get started with the first, first question after that. So maybe let's start with Monique. Hi everyone, pleasure to meet you. Um, I graduated from the Masters of Data Science program at UBC this past June. Um, so 2020. Um, and yes, yeah, since then, um, I've uh, played a couple of different roles. I teach data science um, at Lighthouse Labs, which is sort of a boot camp model. Um, and uh, I'm also my full time job is a, as a senior manager at a solar company based in Austin, Texas. Um, I also do some sort of independent consulting on the side. My background was a, as a management consultant um, to do with data strategy and um, sort of that intersection of, of business and data science. Raphael. Hi, everyone. My name is Raphael. Uh, I'm a Vancouverite group here, but um, went and did my studies in Ontario in legal studies and international relations, and then ended up working in foreign aid in the Middle East for many years. Um, and so I've come back into this program now. Um, I'm in the current cohort, started two months ago. Um, and so if you have particular questions about how it's been um, to study during a pandemic, I think um, I'll have a lot to say about that. So pleased to meet everyone. Looking forward to your questions. Thanks, Raphael. And last but not least, Shayanti. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for this panel discussion. So um, I graduated from UBC Master of Data Science Vancouver campus on the year in the year of 2019. And I have a background of software engineering before I joined Master of Data Science. And post my graduation, I um, joined Ritchie Brothers as a business systems analyst for a couple of months and then I switched to tech resources where I work as a product owner for advanced analytics and digital strategy. And of course, I'm an international student. So uh, questions regarding international students and adaptability, I think I can help you out with that. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, let's get right into the first question. So I'll ask the questions and then uh, you can just jump in if you have uh, an answer. And then if the next person wanted to talk, wants to talk as well, that's fine. Um, so uh, we'll just uh, see how it goes. Um, 
The first question is a general one um, about um, what made you decide to select a master's program versus, um, uh, for example, an online program like a boot camp or Coursera um, or anything like that? I guess maybe I can go first. I mean, for me, uh, coming from a non-STEM background uh, at the undergrad level, um, one of the things that was really appealing was that uh, UBC had a very broad um, and diverse mission statement in terms of its recruitment of its students. Um, the other thing for me was that as a 10 month program, I think it's hard to beat the, uh, the short duration of it, how quickly you, you manage to come out of this. So those were two big things for me. Anyone else? I think I chose a master's program um, really because I needed to understand uh, not just sort of the, the machine learning and, you know, copy code from the internet type of data science, um, but I really wanted to understand how things could be adapted to different uh, situations, um, how to, you know, understand the software side as well as the data science side as well as the statistics end of things. And I think especially on sort of statistics and um, w which is the backbone of a good, good part of data science, you know, a traditional university environment is still, you know, in my mind, one of the better ways to learn that. Um, like I, I'll read sometimes articles online on, you know, popular statistics and we'll find that there's, you know, things can be wrong on the internet. Um, and Coursera, you know, doesn't really address this intersection, which is really new um, between data science and statistics and, you know, software engineering sort of very well. And so I think this 10 month program really manages um, to give an overview of all of those things in a way that's relevant to data scientists and um, helps make them a lot more career ready than, you know, I can copy code from the internet or, um, I only know machine learning, but like I, I can, you know, run it, but I really don't know or understand how it works or why it won't apply to certain situations. So I think for that depth of knowledge and sort of the, the accuracy, if you will, of the knowledge, um, I think that's uh, the master's degree um, to me makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I just want to add for me, uh, when I when I decided to do my master's, I was already working full time as a technical team lead. And um, I was like into the software engineering for almost nine and a half or 10 years. And, and I decided to learn about data science and work as a product owner or work as a person who can work with analytics products and AI products. And um, I think I'll just iterate um, what Monique mentioned. It's more on I wanted to focus clearly on state statistics because programming and software engineering skills was something I was already doing. So, but statistics was something which I did last in my high school. And I really wanted to understand more on uh, what is the reasons and it's not just writing a machine learning code, why we are choosing that particular machine learning model. I just really wanted to know and understand and focus completely. Uh, for me, doing an online course would have not given me that time, that breadth of knowledge or width of knowledge, I would say, rather than choosing a master's program, which is a full time program, uh, gave me that opportunity, that time to slow down, work uh, my work, my like focus fully on the studies and then move back to the market again with the knowledge from end to end. So that's more of my reason to choose a master's program instead of an online program. Great, thank you. Um, so related to that, the next question uh, says, uh, what made you select UBC MDS over other programs at other university? So uh, what, did, uh, what made MDS stand out over other programs? Um, I, if I, if I, if it is okay, if I can go uh, with the answer. So for me, primarily, it was the curriculum and the timing. So it was very important for me that I was not ready to spend two years to do a computer science masters or one and a half years. So it was very difficult to come out of job go back to school for a long period and then go back to job again. So I didn't want to give so much of time, like more than a year. So uh, time was a very important factor for choosing MDS. And 
I think it is needless to say UBC itself is a big reason to uh, look forward to and join, get the network into and join UBC. However, um, I think the time played a very crucial role for me, the duration of the course and the particular subjects and the course material which uh, UBC has placed. So I think that helped me a lot. Uh, just to build on that, I think one of the things that was helpful for me, and it's a bit of the same answer, is that you're actually able to see the MDS curriculum online. And I just shared that in the chat. So you can actually see, like, is this program right for me by going course by course and seeing what is it that you'll be taught. Monique, do you have anything to add to that? or? I think don't underestimate the structure of the program, right? There is a core faculty um, and they teach, I don't know, rough, but like maybe 80% of the courses in the program. These faculty talk to each other and when one part of the curriculum changes, it gets sort of worked into the next part. And that articulation between the courses to, you know, give a 10 month, um, you know, one storyline type of, of degree is really important. I think when I looked at other curriculums of other universities, you know, they treat it like undergrad, right, where there's these four month courses that you pick and choose. And there's no guarantee that at the end, you come up with something that's a the full toolkit, and b the courses are coherent with each other. Right. And so I think where this UBC MDS program differentiates is there, there are four week courses um, and you take four of them at a time and the faculty who teach all of them coordinate heavily with each other to make sure that at the 10 months when you add things, all of the, all of the courses back up together, there was no wasted time and there's nothing missing. And I think that curriculum design, you, you just don't get anywhere else. Great, thank you. Um, the next question you've kind of alluded to uh, when you did your in introductions, but um, it's what level of experience did you have coming into the program? Or what level of experience do you recommend people to have coming into the program? I can start first. Um, I had a business undergrad um, and then uh, spent uh, two, three years in management consulting. So. My background was not math, not, no, I didn't know any coding at all. I mean, I barely did any statistics in undergrad, um, but I was very familiar with how to use data, how to use data to make decisions, but in your traditional sort of Excel um, um, sort of way. And so um, what I found going into the program w was there's a bit of a difference in sort of speed and um, familiarity with uh, the concepts all the way from let's say September until maybe November ish and then that's where the program does this miraculous job of getting everyone sort of up to the same page so that from you know let's call it November on through through the rest of the program um, everyone's coming from sort of the same statistical software engineering um, you know coding sort of experience and so there's a bit it feels like there's a bit of a gap in the first two months of a program and people who don't have that background um, might have to you know well it'll feel a little bit more rough and more weekend time spent sort of reading up on things and but um, that gap quickly diminishes which is quite um, I guess astonishing given sort of how much ground that needs to be covered um, before uh, in, in those two months. I think I'll just add when I join, I kind of have this programming background already because I was a software engineer and my undergraduate was also in information technology. So initially the programming and the Python, all those were not a difficult thing or a struggle for me, but since statistics and maths was not part of my curriculum, like kind of I did like 10, 15 years before, definitely initially few months it was a struggle and i think uh, we had a great cohort so we helped each other a lot and uh, making things uh, understand like i used to tell um, others how to do programming i used to help them with that and people with stats background used to help us who didn't have a stats background so initially there was a bit of a struggle i would say but then post 
few of the blogs everybody we are almost on the same page and the struggles were common the achievements were also common so uh, if you if i go back to the primary question amount of experience or a background which is preferred 100% having some background with either of the two zones either programming or stats will definitely help it depends upon person to person but at the at the end of the day once first two months or three months are over everyone will come back to the same pace and same mode so having background helps not having background yes the struggles get a bit deeper for different sections but it is not something that that can stop you from uh, joining mds or working on as a data scientist yeah and everyone has their strengths and weaknesses right um so I think everyone said that in this panel so far. And to add to that, I think the minimum requirements for admission are there for a reason. And I think they're set at the right level. You know, I had to myself jump through a few hoops and take a few boxes by taking a few additional, just a few of those credits that I didn't have on my transcript, not being from a STEM background. And that did help me. Um, that being said, not being from a programming or statistics background, I think I'm doing fine. And that's not also to say that the course material isn't at a, at a high enough level, I, I do think that people, even if you're familiar with things, it's a lot of work and, and tying the dots together in terms of the knowledge you have from programming and understanding how that relates to statistical concept or vice versa. If you have a, a math background and understanding how that implements into an algorithm, um, I think everyone has something to learn there. So I would say if you're comfortable with the practice test that's uh, posted online um, in terms of that background knowledge and you've got the credits, um, I think you're probably well suited for the program. Um, that being said, that everyone will have an area I think that they're very comfortable in and another area that they then need to put some extra hours during the program. Awesome, thank you. Um, so the next question is um, again related to a preparation before coming into the program. So it's, uh, it says, what self-learning would you recommend um, to prepare oneself to excel in the program, especially if you come from limited non-technical or non-technical background? I would say programming is a good one. Um, just because that's kind of where we start at the beginning. And even though we tighten, they do teach some fundamentals, it goes very quickly. So the, the easier you are able to express your ideas through code, the better. Um, and, and the two main languages being taught in this curriculum on R and Python, if you don't have experience in that one, but another, I think you're still well equipped. Uh, myself, I had much more experience in R coming into this from working in industry, but almost none with Python and I picked it up quickly enough. So if, if you've got a solid foundation in programming, I think that's a good start. Um, of course, you could do other readings in other areas if you find that you've got that covered and you, you wanna cover other areas more, but I think that's also what's been recommended by some of the faculty coming into this. Uh, the month before that we started, people had similar questions. And the recommendation was, if you're going to focus on anything, just brush up your, your programming skills before we start. Yeah, I think um, I'll just second what Rafael said. And I'll just add a, a bit of stats uh, brush up probably could help because uh, personally, that's what I did. I uh, tried to go through uh, Statistics 101. There are plenty of um, courses and also books. I tried to brush it up because that was something I felt I had, uh, I need to brush up because I did not have much of an experience with stats. And I, like, honestly, I forgot everything by the time I tried to join MDS. So I, uh, personally, I did that. So I think a bit of stats uh, brushing up and programming skills um, will definitely help. All right, um, let's go to the next question. Um, they're more about uh, your cohort. So uh, can you talk about the makeup of your cohort and how uh, you interacted with them? Maybe Monique, do you wanna start this time? Yeah, my cohort, um, I don't remember the exact percentages, but I'll tell you what it felt like. <laughs> um, it felt like there was, you know, a good maybe 20, 30% or so who were coming out of undergrad um, and, you know, transitioning into this master's program sort of without any work experience. And then I think 
Um, the remaining 60-70% or so range from a variety of experience, like everywhere from, you know, one to two years of work experience to, you know, like a decade of experience. So of course, there's more on the, you know, one, two to five year end and re returning um, to do a master's um, for a year, you know, before sort of moving on. Um, and so that was my cohort. Um, I thought that was, I mean, it was very helpful. Like I had gone into the program with uh, three years or so, three, four years of work experience. Um, so, I mean, I think the average age of my cohort was probably my age. So um, that was good. And, and the sense of um, the discussions were both like, you know, there's folks who just finished school and there for all the statistics and, and all of that is very fresh. Um, and being in school and doing quizzes and all of that and being in class is very fresh. And then there's those, those of us who are like, okay, let me spend the September getting used to school again. But um, sort of, you know, once you get used to school, there is a whole lot of uh, nuance and discussions um, based on sort of the different experience that people had um in industry i think it's also a very good mix of you know software background stats um lots quite a few biology background economics business so i mean if i were to guess we would probably be roughly well split evenly amongst those was my cohort um the question of how i interacted with them so my program started um, in person and then transitioned online um, in, well, when COVID hit, I don't remember which month that was. Um, so it was good. Like, you got to meet a lot of people in person, build that rapport in person. And as we transitioned online, um, you know, of course, the folks that we got to know well um, were the people we leaned on for a lot of help um, as things transitioned online. And so, um, I mean, yeah, like we interacted over the course of lecture and labs, there's groups, group projects starting in, I think the, the third month of the program, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so, uh, no, it was very, very diverse um, and learned a lot from sort of each other. This program is known for being diverse, by the way. And I think that's a major selling point of this program. Um, what, you know, looking at it from all sorts of different angles where that, that means, people from different countries, different backgrounds. I think that's something that is really stands out uh, with, with UBC MDS. In terms of my interactions, um, I started this program virtual. So, you know, I haven't had a single physical classroom. Um, and that's meant having to interact in different ways and think creatively about how to reach out to people. Um, and undoubtedly, some people lean into the social media more than others. But I think what's been really great is that there's been lots of platforms like Slack uh, and others where there's been a really rich community that's come out um, just virtually. Um, and because we see each other all the time, it's, it is quite easy in some other ways to just set up a Zoom meeting to study with people or to work together, much easier than it might be to say, set up a, a time to meet somewhere physically. So there's pros and cons. And I would say not just in terms of my interaction with, the, with my, my peers, but also the interaction with the faculty has been, I think above and beyond this year. They've really gone the extra mile to um, make themselves incredibly available um, you know, I would say the most days we get, we get responses to questions at 10 PM, even though we don't need to from our faculty. Um, they're extra, extremely flexible in making things relevant and up to date. And so I think that, yeah, I think that that's been something that I've been impressed with, about, with how, how much I've been able to get out of this virtual medium in spite of the pandemic, um, because my expectations were, were naturally quite low that, you know, it would be quite a big blow to switch the format. And it, in some ways it has been, but it's been much better than I expected. Sayanti, do you have anything you would like yeah, to add? Or? I think my experience uh, is like closely matching with uh, Monique's because uh, everything for us was in person. So Rafael has a completely different experience because of the situation. And uh, for us, um, I think similar um, composition of the batch or the cohort, most of the students had two to three years of minimum experience, even having said that there are a couple of students, just they are fresh out of college. And there are students who are like having 20 years of experience, 15 years of experience as well. So the, it never became any point or like, I won't say it has had an advantage or disadvantage per se, because every time we had any class, 
our time mostly spent in graduation lounge or MDS lounge. So we will be spending our time as a group over these lounges and we learned a lot from each other um, from the cohort and the variety and the diversity, what helped us most is their backgrounds. So a lot of people, they, they bring different perception. Like it's not just solving the questions or doing the assignments. It's about a lot of different perceptions. So I think that's um, absolutely enriching. And um, yes, we definitely had an advantage of chatting in person, talking in person, even that, even then Slack was something we like used day in, day out. So Slack was something we used for almost everything. And yes, uh, I, I really want to also mention and highlight. So Rafael mentioned once he got reply at 10 p.m. Uh, let me tell you, I got reply at 12.31 a.m like midnight even. So about the support, I think I really do not have a specific word to express. It's tremendous, like it's immense support, not just from your faculty, uh, teaching assistants, office hours, question anytime you ask. And I remember um, we, we had Rodolfo as our one of our teacher and he will take classes like once even after, after office hour, we will come back with a bunch of questions and he will literally have a huge like one hour session and it's like no more an office hour. The whole class is present during that office hour. So we'll book a class, we will go for another lecture. So the support, it is like tremendous. So I, I think that's the best part. It's not just from the class, it's the cohort, it's other uh, office hour, it is your teaching assistant and everywhere. It's like tremendous support. Thank you, everyone. Um, so uh, the next couple of questions are about online learning. Um, I just wanted to mention really briefly that uh, for September 2021, the program that probably most of our uh, participants will be applying for, we, we are planning to be in person. Um, we, um, we are not an online uh, program. Uh, we just were forced to move online because of the pandemic. And uh, as you can hear, uh, you know, hopefully we did a good job of that. Um, but uh, in 2021, if everything goes well, we'd like to be in the classroom in person again at uh, on campus. Um, but having said that, uh, there is a couple of questions about online learning. So uh, the first one is, tell us a bit about how the virtual version of the program is running. So maybe that's a Raphael and maybe Monique question. Sure. Um, so uh, we have lectures twice a day in the mornings on Zoom. Um, then a two hour break of sorts, though most of us end up working on homework during that time. And then a lab session in the afternoon at two. Um, and then in between that interspersed, there's a lot of office hours scheduled with both the faculty and the teaching assistants um, to ask questions and, and, and uh, work on, on homework. Um, you have four labs per week, one per course, because there's four courses per, per block. So one course, you know, two lectures per, per week. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, it's been, it's been pretty good. I mean, in, in one sense, um, every prof, every teacher has their own style. Um, and so I wouldn't say that there's one approach. Um, some professors have made their lectures from previous years available online in advance and then use the, uh, the lecture time to take questions and do practice problems. Others have done live lecturing. Others still have done, um, pre-recorded lectures, but then they have a sort of viewing session during the lecture so that everyone's viewing it together. Um, of course, we are faced with the reality that many students were not able or are not yet able to be in Vancouver themselves. So we have many people in different time zones. Um, and so what I was saying about the teaching staff being very flexible is they've made many of these formats available for different different realities that different students have, right? Um, so if you want to watch these lectures in advance or in your own time, you can do that. If you want to instead watch it during lecture, you really can do that too. Um, you don't have to come to lab session. You can do it in your own time separately if you want to. And they've also tried to schedule different um, assessments at different times. So that there used to be one quiz session in person, very clear for one class. Um, now they've made two available in two different time zones, right? And, and everyone, regardless of what time zone you're in, can choose which of those assessments you want to take. So they've been incredibly flexible in their approach. Um, I wouldn't say that every prof has the same approach. Um, 
but you can kind of mix and match according to your own learning style. It does mean that you are a little bit more responsible for being on the ball because you're not being handheld. And with that flexibility comes the responsibility to, to stay on track and to manage your time. Um, but I think at this stage in a master's program, most people know how to do that. Uh, and one more thing, they've been incredibly receptive as well to like doing lots of surveys and asking what, what is working for students and what's not. And they've, they've updated their format sometimes quite radically. And this is the other thing where I was saying has been impressed is that sometimes, you know, if it required starting from scratch in terms of a lecture um, and re-recording something because someone didn't like someone or writing twice the amount of quizzes just to accommodate students, they've done that. So that's, that's been incredibly impressive. I don't know if you have anything to add, Monique. Um, the um, no, other than um, like I, I might, I think some of my cohort felt this way. I actually enjoyed um, this online sort of delivery, delivery as much as I did in person. I think there's just pros and cons associated with both, of course, um, and in person, you get the social interaction, you, you, um, you know, get to know your, your, your classmates better. But I actually found um, learn, learning online and being able to pace my own learning, like I'll give a super simple example, like if a lecture is pre-recorded, um, instead of being delivered live in person, the, the benefit that you have is you're able to pause, like when you don't understand something, rewind, play, or literally pause and start, you know, Google, right? Like maybe I missed something or maybe, you know, I'm making connections on my own as I'm learning online in a way that, you know, if I were to Google something in, in the middle of a live lecture, I begin to lose material because I'm clearly not paying attention to what's happening um, in person, right? And so I, I wouldn't discount online as being inferior to in person. I just think they're actually two very different methods of the delivery that um, in many ways, if um, you can self-manage your learning and drive your learning, which you know should be expected of a master's program, that um, both just have their relative merits. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, so let's move into the actual courses and the curriculum. Um, can you talk about um, what practical things you have learned in the program? things that you're maybe using in your job right now? Yeah, I, make it, I can maybe start. Um, so, I mean, the obsession with data science very often is with machine learning or, you know, artificial intelligence and, you know, computer vision. You hear all these fancy terms. Um, I think, and this actually also answers the question of why, why a master's degree, you know, at a university and not a boot camp is the part that I ended up finding the most relevant for my line of work, which is more, you know, corporate strategy, um, is actually um, experimental design and causal inference. Um, and that's not something sort of people traditionally associate with data science or think, well, I'm going to do a data science degree so I can learn how to do, you know, A-B testing scaled up, right, in, in different situations. But um, in my line of work, um, that's been incredibly important. And even the online resources available to understand this field is very sparse. But we're very lucky to have a course dedicated to this, faculty dedicated to this, and, and learn this almost the right way. Um, I, I, you know, even during the program, I helped sort of uh, a local company out for, you know, short two weeks because they were setting up their <laughs> A-B testing sort of in a way that wouldn't yield any sort of results and they wouldn't be able to derive any insight from it. And in, in, in industry, many companies can afford to actually do A-B testing, do it better and do it right in a way that they're not drawing basically the wrong conclusion, um, but that simply isn't being done. Um, and so, uh, you know, to me, you know, a bit niche, um, but uh, that was very important to me. So uh, for me, uh, before I say what I practically use, uh, I, I have to say what uh, my course of work is. So right now I am into a mining industry and uh, what we are trying to achieve is to have digital solutions so that we can reduce and increase the productivity and reduce number of accidents or number of um, events where we have a lot of people involved. We do not want those dangerous spots to be uh, having more people. So it's more on uh, 
predictive models and more on analyzing on what can be done better with the data. So all our products are machine learning products. So as a product owner, what I mostly use, first part is loads of visualization, loads of, uh, inform loads of data, which I have to visualize, I have to figure out the trends. And then we have a separate team who is uh, taking care of all the data science activities, which is typically machine learning model and everything. But being a product owner, what I have to understand is the AI model life cycle and to make sure that this can get deployed and to understand what model to be used and what not to be used uh, with collaboration with my team and my stakeholders. So the most important thing which I have uh, taken out of this course is to understand, visualize the data for see the trend and a lot of machine learning understanding and why to use what model in what situation. So that is something I have to do day in, day out, understand. And my role also demands me to play a role of a translator. So my stakeholders who has no idea about analytics, for them, it's all, this is the business I need me being a person who can understand, convert this business into analytics, talk to my data scientists, understand the machine learning situation, issues, why are we using what, the matrix, and then convert it into a business language. I think this is something which is very much I do and it's most critical part of my role because if this handshake is not happening, both of the parties have no idea what's, what's going on and what they are gonna see next. So that's something which I use almost every day, all the machine learning concepts and ideas and majorly data visualization and checking the trends and different plots and et cetera. Great, thank you. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the intensity of the program? How intense is it? Raphael. I see the smile it's in the face. Yeah, no, when it's intense. Comes in place. Yeah, um, it's a lot of work. Uh, and um, even though I think, as I said, many things about the virtual format have been great, it's also pretty emotionally draining to be behind a computer screen all the time and, and, and engaging in that format a lot. So it's intense. It can be, it can be exhausting. Um, I think coming into this program, I had a fairly good handle on most areas and even myself I'm finding that it's yeah that I'm spending a lot of time working on this um, so there was also a related question I saw in the chat can you do a part-time job during this this program and I, I the messaging has been always like we really recommend we don't we don't do that and I would completely agree with that there are some people who manage to you know keep maybe one days of work if they're working part-time but I've seen them kind of burn out or have to like cancel those days of work with their employers um, and even the people who do manage to make that time um, often just end up even more exhausted. So I, I think it's not, you need to treat this program for what it is, a 10 month program where they condense everything um, a lot. And, and I think, yeah, I think most of us find that it's a lot to handle even when we don't have um, major other commitments. Anything to add Monique or Shayanti? It's intense. There is no other, yeah. nothing um, like there is no other way to express it in any different way. It's intense. It's definitely intense. And I think it depends upon, I, I am really, I don't know from our cohort if anybody has ever uh, tried to work during this 10 months. But even if someone did, I would say if you think that everything is like, okay, you can still do, if you can still manage time, I would say just take rest. It's super intense. Don't like block the whole time if and only if you can manage to not work during the time. I would say always choose not to work because it's really intense. And if you get time, I would say do some your own project. Like try to not just think MDS with the assignments. It's not MDS is not equal to just the assignments. Having more projects, trying out hackathons, working on different projects, applying all those what you learn beyond the assignments, I think that's way more helpful and effective use of time during this 10 months. Um, think, you know, 8 a.m. till 9 p.m., 10 p.m. during the week, 
um, just stuff with stuff um, most of the day on Saturday. And most people find a way to either just do casual reading um, or, you know, explore other things on, on Sunday, um, you know, and rest. Um, and if you're in Vancouver, you know, do yoga, go ski, something. <laughs> Thank you. So um, a related question, I, uh, I don't know if you've already answered it, but uh, what's the most challenging thing in the program? I think for me, um, it was just the ever evolving, what do I want to do after? Um, master's data science and I, I would say I probably went through sort of you know some major like met several major shifts um, you know throughout the program from you know I, I can imagine myself you know having you know doing date being a data scientist in role and title afterwards um, to you know maybe I can stand up a, a consulting practice you know doing this particular area of data science to, um, you know, where I eventually ended up, which is, um, you know, still during doing corporate strategy, um, but now, you know, with a lens for how machine learning data science um, plays into sort of the future and the product development and the product development roadmap of a company. Um, and so I think to me, it's what's nice is that, you know, and that's goes to the, the program is every, you know, two blocks. It's like, oh, this is, you know, I'm learning something new. This is so cool. I can see how this could have been applied um, in industry and then coming up with basically an, another yet another idea of, you know, what I can do with this degree and then having sort of this enormous amount of opportunity. Um, that's not just, you know, I, I want to be just a data scientist, not that, you know, data scientist is a very small thing, but like, you know, maybe I want to do something different. Um, and me changing my mind on that, you know, every couple of blocks is, I think, a good thing. Um, just specifically on the, in terms of the difficulty of the courses, uh, it really varies person to person. You know, I have friends who like really struggle with course A and I find that fine. And my struggle is course B and they come from a background where that's really easy for them. Um, so I think it's hard to generalize. Yeah, I think my initial, I think my primary and initial challenge was uh, going back to the school mode, having uh, working for such a long time, it was really difficult to go back to school where I am into a lecture for so many hours, going back doing assignments, and it's not like job, it's not like work. So I think I had that initial challenge for I think one month for sure. Um, apart from that, the only thing I wouldn't say it was a challenge, but I was a bit worried on, I, I wanted to do, go to, I wanted to do a job where I don't have to give away my past experience. So I wanted a combination where I can still take the advantage of my experience and move forward and also utilize what I have learned throughout uh, my MBS. So finding that proper role and it's not that typical data scientist or data analyst role which will fit that bill for me so finding that role and having a finding a company which has that kind of role i was a bit concerned during my course not knowing how things will turn up but then eventually everything went fine great thank you um so a question that has been coming in in the q a is about whether the 10 why do you feel that the 10 month months is enough um, to transition into a career as a data scientist or analyst? I think um, I wouldn't have spent anything more than 10 months or wanted to in a traditional sort of course environment um, to learn this. Now, that doesn't answer the question of whether it's enough because it depends on what you're defining as enough just to put things into context, right? Like this is an area of study where people get PhDs in it. Um, and, you know, th even that's not enough and people go on to do postdocs um, and, uh, you know, be it at a tech company as a research scientist or in the university environment. And the, the field, you, you know, 
continues to be developed in um, sort of very fundamental ways, right? So is a 10 month master's program enough for you, know, you to know the field well enough to sort of you know, jump into any problem and know what the answer is right away to it? No, but nor does anyone else. Right. And so I think what the program gives you, which is why I said, you know, I wouldn't have wanted to spend any more than 10 months is now at least I know where to start when given a brand new problem and know how to approach it from a academic literature review point of view from a, you know, here are the three techniques I think that could potentially solve this, but they need to be sort of experimented on um, and tried before we know, because the answer is no one knows. Um, and so I think from that point of view, the 10 months is sufficient to know where to start on a particular data science or machine learning problem. Um, and you know, there's way more to learn. It's an evolving field. Um, and what you're learning is how to learn these things. I'll simply second Monique, nothing extra to add. Great, um, thank you. Um, so let's move a little bit into um, your path towards the job that you have right now after graduation. Um, can you uh, talk a little bit about um, how, you know, how long it took you after graduation to find a job, what kind of jobs were out there, how, you know, how, what kind of jobs did you apply for, those kind of things, and then how, you, how did you end up where you are right now? Um, so I graduated on our last session was June, I think end of June. And then I got my first job on 6th September, if I very clearly remember the date, because I was super happy, of course. <laughs> so it took me from like a couple of months almost to get, um, so to be, uh, to be very clear on this, the first job which I got uh, for Richie Brothers, that was not exactly what I was looking for. However, I'll be very honest, uh, since I got that offer, I didn't want to say no, because finance is also a big point. So I want to get keep getting my salary to run my house. And I still wanted to keep looking at where I want to really work on. So while doing that, um, it took me some three, four months more to get the job which I really wanted to do. Like, and this is like my perfect match. I never thought I will find a job with this combination where I can do both and have the best of both the worlds with my experience and my learning. So that was my specific challenge because I wanted this particular thing. However, if you are looking for data scientists, data analysts, data engineering roles, which the count of those opportunities are way more than what I was looking for. So I would say don't uh, attach my timing to get my dream job with all these roles. So I know all my friends, they got data scientists, data analysts, or data engineering type of roles way before me because my uh, lookout was kind of different and a bit challenging when it comes when you try to do all these combination stuff. That's the reason why it took me kind of four months or five months to get my dream job. And um, I would say that's where you need to understand what you are looking for and uh, don't connect this time with other uh, roles. Yeah, I have a bit of a non-traditional story, um, but Here's what, what it is. Um, so I was interviewing during Capstone um, and got my offer for, to teach data science with Lighthouse Labs in the last week of Capstone and started around two weeks after Capstone um, teaching data science. And that was pretty much very much a part time gig. I intended it to be so so that I could get some income in and then you know figure out what I wanted to do next and have that time to actually take a breather, you know, rest, think about, um, much like science, you like, how does my previous experience actually intersect with this new experience? 
and how do I go go to the job market um, with all of that in mind. Um, while I was doing this Lighthouse Lab teaching data science bootcamp thing, um, I also, I have been an independent consultant for some time. And so I picked up a, a contract or two, um, just helping, you know, from everything from startups to, you know, a well-established company um, formulate sort of their data strategy, because um, they're thinking about hiring data scientists in the future with, you know, a certain product but um, didn't really know sort of what data scientists really did or what was the possibility. Um, if you staff a data science team, what, what kind of business impact um, could, could that hold? Um, so did a bit of that in sort of the last two months, and this is like only a couple months ago. Um, and then finally through my previous network, um, found this role um, with a solar company um, and then joined them also in September. I think my start date was like September 7th or something like that. Um, so, um, and then I, I've been at that, at this company now um, for, I don't know, is it six weeks, seven weeks um, and up until now. Um, thank you, great. Um, can you talk, you mentioned Capstone, Monique. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about um, Capstone, uh, what kind of organizations uh, participated in Capstone for your cohorts and what you uh, ended up doing and how it helped you uh, get to where you are? Yeah, maybe I can start. So um, I did my Capstone with BGC Engineering. They were looking to develop a computer vision model to identify um, tailings dams, which are sort of this waste product of mining um, from satellite imagery. Um, it was a team of four classmates. We worked on it over eight weeks, pretty much full-time hours. Um, and uh, we were very successful actually in our project. We developed a model that um, sort of uh, could, could find these things with like 95% accuracy, which is, um, great um, in terms of a, you know, we, we learned something and we successfully sort of built something that had a tremendous sort of industry application. Um, I guess um, how that got me to here, I think during the Capstone project was actually when I realized that um, maybe I don't want to be a data scientist in the sense that maybe I don't want to code every day. Um, and, you know, the parts and the role that I played on my capstone project team and because of my background was very much like communication for sure, you know, why does what we're solving matter and prioritization of activity, which is, um, you know, as a, in its relationship to data science, which is, I guess, you know, compared to my classmates and that peer set, at least I could figure out how my ex experience from before has a role in data science. So that was very helpful. The second thing that was helpful was just having an idea of like how, you know, quickly can something be developed in industry and, you know, for what reasons, right? Like we had a very good data set. It was a very confined problem. Um, computer vision is something that, you know, still sounds sort of out there, but is actually very achievable in a lot of contexts. Right. So, you know, having a high level understanding from a business person's point of view, as in, you know, these things are achievable with this much time put into it um, under this time frame and with these prerequisites, like that's something that's very helpful in my role um, for, you know, figuring out how data science can even fit into the development of products um, and, and future strategy. And so, you know, witnessing that firsthand, um, you know, within an academic program is quite valuable. In itself um, and yeah I mean I guess those are the two things I th um, there was two capstone groups with BGC engineering I think uh, in the other capstone group that did a bit of flood forecasting I think one of my classmates actually got a job at BGC engineering so not me personally um, but you know out of the eight students who worked with this capstone partner um, one of them landed a, a position with the capstone partner so I'll say all in all that's that's a pretty good result So I'll just add what caption project we did because uh, almost everything what Monique says is applicable for our project as well. So we did with Urban Logic and our problem was to figure out what are the most influencing factors to uh, prevent collision. 
And the best part of Capstone is you work with real data. You work with uh, real data, you work with people who are into the market already. And uh, we used to travel to their office and work from there. And uh, the best, another thing which we enjoyed the most during our Capstone is what work we did. They took our work and they presented to that um, state government where they want to uh, prepare policies so that the number of collision is reduced for uh, a certain area so that was very encouraging and that was like we had the, that is the only possible way we got to see the closest of how data science in real life works and i think rest of the thing what monique said i'll just um, second all of those points which is like common for capstone Awesome. Thank you very much. We have five minutes left. So uh, maybe as a kind of a wrap up question uh, to keep the theme of careers and jobs after graduation and, and Raphael, feel free to um, uh, chime in. Um, how do you see um, the data science job market uh, uh, growing or changing with, you know, with this pandemic uh, going into the future and also um, do you think, you know, what do you, how do you feel that the industry is going to react and is it going to grow? Is it going to stagnate? What, what are your feelings about just the general job market? I know it's a kind of a hard question, but it, you guys are working and Raphael, you're kind of in the middle of it. So what are your opinions on that? I'll just answer it in one word. It is going to grow. It is growing and it's going to grow and grow more because now is the point where uh, industries is getting the uh, understanding of what it can do. So previously it was more of a, okay, data science is a magic you give and everything happens. But now they are also getting uh, the understanding, stakeholders are getting prepared and understanding the analytics as well. So I think it is gonna grow for 100%. Um, couple comments on this. Uh, first is that I think remote work is growing um, and uh, you know, for, for better or worse during COVID, a lot of us are, are learning um, sometimes for the first time how to do that or, you know, adapting our lifestyles um, to do that. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is um, I think there's going to be a growing demand for data scientists, but also a growing demand for people who just understand data science, who, you know, like Sianti and myself, who actually in the company perform these different roles. Before a company is ready to hire data scientists, they need business folks who actually know what to do with these people and, and where, um, you know, they, their work products, you know, actually leads to. So I see a world where sort of data, sort of tech companies, as you know, are very ready for these data scientists because they have a framework, they have lots of data, um, they're able to use this talent in sort of effective ways and by effective, I also mean like profitable ways. But as sort of these machine learning applications grow, um, I think there's this whole world of business um, that, you know, traditionally haven't hired data scientists that are actually hiring people who understand data science in order to create sort of a role or a purpose for um, data scientists to exist. And so I think I wouldn't think of it so narrowly as just data scientists, but this broader world um, as well that that's going to grow. Yeah, I agree with Monique. I think that's exactly the sweet spot that we're seeing. Um, it's not going to be so much focused on writing the exact code. There's so many tools coming out now that automate a lot of this behind the scenes. It's, it's really about being that value proposition that machines probably won't replace for a long time, which is interpretation, which is explanation. You know, you have to make sense of it and you have to know how to frame the problem before you even start it. And that's, that's something that machines are far from doing for us. Um, and this is kind of how MDS positions itself. It's more on the knowledge side maybe less on the pure mathematics or pure comp sci side, right? It tries to marry all of those things, but really emphasizes communication, ethics. Those are things that are just growing right now in terms of the need for humans to, to play that role. So I would say, I, I think things look good for, for people who are graduating with this specific degree. Well, thank you so much. Um, we are at the end of the one hour. Um, Monique, Raphael, and Chayanti, thank you so much for joining us and uh, giving us your insights. I hope uh, that um, uh, the session was uh, useful for the participants. 
And if you have any other questions, you can always email us. Um, uh, the email address is in the chat, uh, I believe. And um, we will be, as I mentioned before, uh, we will in December, we'll do another um, a question and answer kind of panel uh, with uh, some other directors and academic folks uh, to talk about admissions and um, financial aid, tuition, any any kind of kind of more technical questions uh, regarding application to MDS. So once again, thank you for joining us, and uh, hope to see you in December. Bye. Bye. Thank you.